Hello, and welcome to Sobercast. We provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in a podcast format. We are an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into the virtual basket. Also, if you're a member of NA or have friends that are, please tell them about our other podcast, Napod. Napod features NA speakers and workshops in the same format as Sobercast. We upload a new speaker every day, and it's easy to subscribe by searching for Napod, N-A-P-O-D, all one word, on any podcast player app, or go to Napod.xyz if you'd like to listen online. Hope you enjoy the podcast and have a great day. Step seven, a uh, good friend is speaking tonight, Anne Marie from Thursday Night of Vision for You. And I'll bring up Anne Marie. Good evening, my name is Anne Marie, I'm an alcoholic. And um, I'm kind of actually stumped right now because I opened up the workshop packet that Karen has today. Uh, probably about two hours ago, and I looked at step seven, and I've had a completely new experience this year with the steps. And when I looked at step seven, I just started laughing because I have been living in step seven for the last year. And, um, and uh, basically, you know, I don't know how many of you guys have this packet, but step seven problem being arrogance. And for me, arrogance is kind of a definition of an alcoholic. I think I know everything. I think I know what's right for me. I think I know what's right for you. I think I know what I want. I think I know, you know, basically, like, which way to turn on the road. And, and, and the fact of the matter is, for me, is that the longer I'm sober, the, the more I don't know. The more I don't know what's good for me, I don't know what's good for you, the more uh, I realize that my life does not belong to me simple as that. My life is whatever God's going to make my life. And my job is to show up. Um, I did not used to live that way. I used to live in a very arrogant, very self-centered and self-seeking fashion. And and what does that mean? You know, for a long time I came to AA and people would say, oh, I was so self-centered. And I was like, yeah, me too. And I really didn't know what that meant. And same thing with self-seeking. Um, Same things with a lot of the terms that we have here. I didn't really know what they meant. And um, I can tell you that the way that I used to live was uh, from the time I was a little girl, my life was really about getting what I wanted. My life was very rarely um, accepting what was in front of me. My life was very much about getting what I wanted and feeling the victim for not getting what I thought I was entitled to. You know, I mean, I I grew up in in a... nice house. I lived up at Marstown, and um, I had two parents who fought a fair amount and a father who drank a fair amount, and two older siblings who took very, very good care of me in the middle of the chaos, but the chaos wasn't really all that bad, to be completely honest with you. Um, And here I am, as young as I can remember, feeling sorry for myself that this is my family. You know, I mean, how many six, seven, eight-year-olds sit there and feel sorry for themselves? Like, this is my family. Poor me. And it's not like I know any better, technically, but somehow I'm feeling bad for myself. And, um, and that, that victimhood only got worse as I continued, uh, as I continued to get older. And, um, and I remember when I was about nine and I found alcohol, um, I didn't actually start drinking then. I just happened to find it then, and then I didn't drink again for a little while. But I happened to find it then, and it was the first time that I didn't really feel bad for myself. It was the first time that I, uh, I always describe it as, you know, the world got a little brighter. The colors got a little sharper. It was almost like I went from regular TV to high-definition TV, and that's what alcohol did for me when I was a kid. It was like all of a sudden everything just seemed a little better. And everything seemed like it was going to be okay. And I had this, this trust in life that, that everything is as it's supposed to be, and this is awesome. And that's how alcohol became my solution. That's what I look for in life. That's, that's where my alcoholism brings me. I, I go to a place without alcohol in my system or living in untreated alcoholism. I go to a place where I'm afraid of everything, 
where, um, where nothing is as it should be, where nothing is right, where um, I am the victim of the world, where I become a martyr, where I know what's best for everybody and everything around me, and nothing matches that, and nothing is satisfying me. You know, people say, you know, restless, irritable, and discontent. That's a very good way, to, first description of alcoholism in the big book. Restless, irritable, and discontent. Now, again, when I heard that, I was like, yeah, me too. But what, is, what does restless mean? You know, it's like, for me, I was told restless means you're uneasy. Living in a constant state of being uneasy. And then restless, irritable, uh, irritable easily annoyed, and discontent. This is the one that, that clinched me. Never satisfied. Never satisfied. No matter what came down the pike, never satisfied. You know, I never had the experience, probably because I was too young, where it was like I couldn't get the house big enough. I couldn't get the, you know, best-looking guy. I couldn't get the best car. I couldn't get all those things that we worry about now as adults. But even as a kid, I was never satisfied. If my mom asked me what I wanted for my favorite, you know, what I wanted for my birthday dinner, it was she didn't really care enough about me to take me out to dinner. Okay, well, now, if my mom wanted to take me out to dinner for my birthday, I was like, oh, she doesn't care enough to cook me dinner. You know, I was just never, nothing was ever good enough. And um, no matter how you tried to show me that you loved me, I wouldn't accept it. Um, you know, even as a, even as a small child, I, I just very much was uh, all about getting my own way. And if you didn't show me love the way that I wanted you to show me love, then you didn't love me. I was always in control, you know, and my father, who was my absolute best friend, go figure, he drinks a fair amount, um, but my father was my absolute best friend, and I even remember, again, before I was drinking on a regular basis, I was uh, 10, and my mom told me I could not have my birthday party in tents out in the backyard, and I was like, oh, yeah? I was like, come on, please, and she's like, no, and I was like, mm-hmm, and I walked in the next room to where dad was, and I was like, daddy, daddy, I have a question for you. And I nuzzled right up to my dad, completely manipulated him into giving me the birthday party I wanted. We all spent out, you know, slept out in the backyard in the tents and everything like that. And sure enough, what did I think? I thought my mom hated me and my dad loved me. Why? Because I got what I wanted. So I equated what, how you felt about me with whether or not you gave me what I wanted. And what I want is another way of saying I'm in control. And, um, and I'm in charge of my life. Um, when I started to drink, I really left, you know, I again was in control and was in charge, but had no problem letting alcohol take over. Had no problem letting alcohol take over. You know, I was the type of drinker where I didn't know what was going to happen when I drank, and that was the only time that I didn't know what was going to happen didn't bother me. You know, it was the only time that I was okay with, oh, whatever, wherever the chips are going to fall, they're going to fall. Um, because what it came down to is that alcohol gave me that feeling, like I said before, alcohol gave me that solution to the constant uneasiness inside of me, the constant never trusting anything, the constant always afraid, the constant upset and dissatisfied with life. Um, alcohol took that away from me. Um, and that's why alcohol worked for such a long time. By the time that I... Uh, came to AA, I had absolutely destroyed my life on the outside, and more importantly, I destroyed my life on the inside. Um, by the time I came to AA, I got sent here by a judge. I didn't necessarily voluntarily be like, hey, let me go to an AA meeting. That sounds like a good idea on Saturday night. Um, I knew it's where I wanted to be, but it's, it wasn't where I wanted to be, and it didn't fit into my plan of life, so I wasn't going to do it. Mind you, I'm sitting at my mother's shore house, drinking every night by myself, um, nobody really was left, nobody in the state of New Jersey would speak to me. Um, I did have one hostage that I called my boyfriend who was living in Texas, and he was an absolute angel. He absolutely saved my life that last year drinking. Um, I, I, I shudder to think what would happen to me if it hadn't been for him. Um, because in so many ways, he, he was such a good caretaker that the only two nights that I uh, was away from him that last year were like the two worst nights of my life. You know, he literally would stay sober and just follow me around New Orleans, like making sure I get home. And, um, and what happened was, was that uh, 
Where was I? Oh, so anyway, he was the only person that would talk to me, and my father was the only person that would talk to me. And my father and I would have long conversations at night, and then the next day I have no idea we spoke to each other. And, um, and my family treated me like I was a statute. I had, you know, I, I did the things outside of myself that a lot of people do. I had wrecked two cars, one of which, well, actually neither of which were mine. Um, I had gotten a DWI. I had gotten charged with a couple of other criminal offenses. Um, I had tried to kill myself at this point twice. I had been hospitalized in a psychiatric unit for anorexia when I was a teenager. And um, I had gotten sent away from boarding school, almost gotten kicked out twice. Specifically, of course, right around my mother's wedding because, God forbid, I let her be happy for a second. Um, and uh, I just, anybody, anybody that I spoke to, to a certain degree, I, I harmed. I was just, I was that tornado that they described. It was like, if you gave me five minutes, I will be happy to shed like five years off your life for some reason. Like, I'll scream at you, I'll verbally abuse you, I'll manipulate you, I'll do whatever I need to do to get you to fit the role I want you to play tonight. And, um, and that's how I lived my life towards the end. Once, um, once I got here, and I got here completely by divine intervention. Uh, my family had been trying to help me get sober <laughs> for probably about a year and a half. And um, I remember I was standing before this judge who told me I didn't, wasn't really going to get in much trouble if I agreed to go to rehab, and I, I didn't really want to go to rehab. And at this point, I had spent about six months going to AA meetings and going home and drinking. I had gone six months probably every other day riding my bike to an AA meeting and going home and drinking. And I had been told over and over, you don't want it enough. Well, I didn't really know how to want it any more than I did. And the more that I was told you don't want it enough, the less I wanted to come back. The less I, I understood. I was like, well, if I don't want it enough yet, I'm here. I'm 19. I don't have any friends, license, car, family, nothing. Like, I don't really know how to want it much more than that. And um, I could not produce this will to live. I couldn't do it. I couldn't produce this will to want to get sober necessarily. I couldn't produce this will to want to go through this work. But what I could do was I could give up. Just give up on the way life was and just be like, I don't know what I'm doing. And that's why I say that, you know, step seven, the problem is arrogance. For me, alcoholism is just extremely arrogant to start with because the, the first touch of freedom I ever have started with saying, I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't necessarily want this life anymore, but I don't know what type of life I want. I really don't know which way to go anymore. I don't know who's going to be in my life. I don't know why they're going to be in my life. I don't know if I'm going to have anybody in my life. I don't know what I want to do when I grow up. I don't know where I want to work. I don't know if I want to go to school. I don't know if I want a boyfriend. I don't know if I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know. And every time I end up in a place of I don't know, that is the exact opposite of the arrogant, self-centered, self-seeking alcoholic that I naturally left to my own devices, am. So for me, that's always the starting point. And that's, that's always the starting point of change. It's always where God can get involved. Every single time I've ever, I've ever landed there, God gets involved. To a certain degree, I wish I landed there every day because God always performs major miracles whenever I finally get there. Um, but when I got to uh, when I got to AA, that was that was pretty much how I was. I was like, I don't I don't know. And um, I got to started. I went to rehab, and for me, rehab was necessary. I could not go 24 hours without drinking. I I my physical allergy and my physical um, dependence upon alcohol. I had to be in a place where I could taper off and become medically sound before you released me back into the community. Um, but you unfortunately did not, necessarily, did not necessarily be mentally sound before I got released back into the community, um, where I came home and they said, go to a meeting. So I said, okay, I go to a meeting. So I went to a meeting and they said, raise your hand if you're new. And I raised my hand 
And I proceeded to go to a meeting every day and raise my hand for like a week and a half saying I was new because no one told me that any different. I was in such a place of I don't really know what's going on that I'm just going to keep raising my hand saying I'm new, I'm new, I'm new, I'm new, I'm new. And finally someone came out to me and they're like, you're not new anymore. Okay. You just come back tomorrow. You don't need to raise your hand. We know who you are at this point. You're not new. And I was like, okay. And, um, and that is literally how I lived my first year and a half sober was I did what you told me to do. Until you changed the direction, I kept doing it. So you said, go to a meeting every day. I went to a meeting every day for like a year and a half. You know, it was like they said, get to know people. I really did not like talking to people. I was so shy. But once I finally started talking to people, I kept talking to people. And then people were like, wow, you don't shut up, do you? Um, and I was like, you told me to talk. So, um, you know, and then they were like, start sharing. And then next thing you know, I was that person that would share every meeting. And every meeting I had something to say for about 15 minutes. Um, and, uh, you know, then someone was like, stop sharing. And I was like, okay, I'll stop sharing. And so it was, I literally lived on whatever direction AA gave me. And, uh, and that amazing um, angel that I had in my life, my boyfriend, when I was drinking, he was still my boyfriend in early sobriety. And at some point we broke up. Now, I would love to tell you that we broke up and at the time, I'm sure I told people that we broke up because he was X, Y, and Z. He wasn't X, Y, and Z. I manipulated that situation because I wanted out of the relationship and couldn't actually say, I want out of this relationship. So you needed to become this villain so I could be the victim so we could break up. And uh, so I manipulated that breakup, and um, that actually brought me to a place where I, for the first time, truly hit my knees. And I was at about a year and a half sober. And I remember somebody told me, somebody said to me, you know what you have to do? And I said, no. She said, you have to pray. And I started sobbing. I actually didn't really cry at the breakup. I started sobbing when she told me I had to pray. And she's like, why are you crying? And I said, because I don't know how to do that. And I'm embarrassed that I have a year and a half sober and I don't know how to pray. I'm embarrassed that I don't know what you mean when you say turn it over. When you say let it go. What, what, I, don't, I don't understand, and I feel like my lack of understanding is going to start killing me because I don't know which way to go. So again, it started with the I don't know what's going on, and I don't know which way to go, and I don't know how to live at this point. And that brought me to um, a place where I found a woman who would take me through the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous and take me through the steps as they're laid out there. And um, ever since then, my life has never been the same. <laughs> It has been one amazing, amazing journey, and my life continues to be um, a life beyond my wildest dreams, one that I never pictured I would live. And um, it seems, it, and it keeps going like that. I never ever pictured this life would be mine. Um, that was in 1999 that I found the steps. And since then, I have gone through the big book a number of times, with specifically with three or four different people. Um, and I sponsored a lot of people through the steps. And when I sponsor people through the steps, it brings me through the steps. Um, because that's just how I like to do it. I'm not going to sit here and ask you to do something or ask you to consider something if I'm not going to sit here and consider it. And it seems like also the longer I'm sober, the considerations I give to my sponsees are really my considerations, so I kind of feel bad giving them busy work because I'm like, wow, I think that was meant for me. But, um, you know, I, uh, that's just the way that God has seemed to work. And in the beginning when I had worked um, through the steps and I had done my first fourth step with Cass, after I was done with the fifth step, she had asked me, she said, are you willing, um, are you willing to let go of all of these things? You know, she said, she brought me to the, the one little paragraph in step six in the big book, and she said, okay, are you, are you willing? And I was like, yeah, I'm willing. She's like, okay, why are you willing? And I was like, I just saw how, for the first time in my life, and this is, you know, I was so self-centered, and I was so dishonest and so fearful, and for the first time in my life, I'd never seen this about myself before. You know, I'd seen everything wrong with you, and at the same time, I had beaten up on myself to such a pulp that... I told you I hated myself, but I couldn't pinpoint why I hated myself. So I was like the perfect example of the egomaniac with the inferiority complex. Because um, on the one hand, I knew everything, and on the other hand, you knew nothing. So um, 
I had, she had asked me, are you willing to let go of all these defects of character? And I was like, oh my God, yeah, I'm willing to let go of them. And she was like, great, hit your knees. And we took the seventh step prayer. And I got up and I went home and I made my eighth step list and I proceeded to go out and I proceeded to make amends. And there was a revolutionary change. There was a drastic change in me. There was a change that only God could produce. All of a sudden, um, I did. I started, you know, the seven step promise or the step seven promise, self seeking slip away. That actually did start to slip away. That actually, I actually started to take interest in my fellows. I did. I wasn't as uh, fearful of the world as I once had been. I um, trying to think. I had a new God consciousness, and I had a new confidence in myself that did not come from myself. Um. And I started to have dreams in life. I started to believe that if I kept putting my first, like my front foot forward, that I could achieve the things that I wanted to achieve. I wanted to finish college, and I did. I went back to school and I finished college. I wanted to go to grad school. I wanted to become the profession that I'm in now, and I did. I did all of it. I didn't do it by myself. I did it with a higher power. Um, but that was probably the most significant thing about steps, the steps the first time I went through them, and it happened in six and seven. And it happened because for me, that's where the change takes place. Eight and nine, I follow it up with action. I start to take, I start to go back, make amends, and start to fill in that circle and live in the circle and live in 10, 11, and 12. Um, and what happened was for me was that at a certain point, at seven years sober, six years sober six or seven years sober, I, um, my ego had rebuilt itself and I had come to a place where the best I can put it is that I thought I was keeping me sober. You know, it was, it was one of those things where it was, um, you know, people say, God keeps you sober, you do the steps to grow closer to God. I did the steps so I could be better and keep myself sober. It was like that whole triangle of, you know, you do the steps, you grow closer to God, God keeps you sober. It was like, I do the steps, I stay sober. <laughs> there, was no, there was no God in there. And, um, and for me, now in hindsight, I can see when I say my ego rebuilds itself, what I really am talking about is I become extremely arrogant again. Again, that's a step seven problem. But for me, what I needed to do at that time was go back to step one. And I went through this intense step one process that took a while. Um, but where I went through the first 103 pages and uh, pretty much turned almost every sentence into a question to actually consider. But most importantly for me, from that process, I came to know my powerlessness and my unmanageability in a way that I had never understood it before. I came to truly embrace the fact that without 2 through 12, I will die. I don't do the steps because I'm a good person. I don't do the steps because I want to live like Mother Teresa. I do the steps because I'm still breathing. And ideally today, I'd like to keep breathing. That's why I do the steps. I don't do them because I want, like I said, I don't do them because I want to be a good person. I do them so I can stay alive. Because my life depends on this program. And I am very clear on that. If I do not work this program, alcoholism will kill me, whether I drink or not because I am fully capable of catching a resentment at 12 noon and by 4 p.m. being homicidal or suicidal. And if I don't kick the steps into action, I don't know what's going to happen the next day. I do not live on my power today. I live on God's power today. And I trust my higher power, and I work the steps so I can continue to grow closer to my higher power so he can save me from this disease of alcoholism that I know will kill me whether I drink or I don't. So... What has happened was after I finished that step one process, I went through the rest of the steps. And probably the biggest lesson I got from working step seven that time was part, the part in the seventh step prayer where um, the seventh step prayer on page 60, uh, 76 where it says, My creator, I am now willing that you should have all of me, good and bad. Good and bad. I don't know what's good or bad. I don't know what's going to be good or what's going to be bad. I do know that if I show up 
life happens and God takes care of me. And I do also know, and I've had a lot of experience this way, what appears to be bad can actually turn out to be fantastic. And what appears to be good can actually turn out to be a disaster. You know, I mean, I didn't grow up saying, I really want to be an alcoholic when I grow up. That sounds like a fantastic idea. I know you want to be a fireman. You want to be a police officer. You want to be, you know, President of the United States. I want to be a fall-down drunk that hurts every single person that comes in her way. That's what I want to be. No. That was like the worst thing that could have happened to me. To me, that could be the worst thing that could happen to me. Because I actually despised alcoholism growing up because of how it tore apart my family. In all honesty, it's the best thing that ever happened to me. Because if it wasn't for alcoholism, I wouldn't have found AA. I wouldn't have found the principles, the spiritual principles that I live by. I wouldn't have found specifically women, but all people, but specifically the women in my life who truly make up my family today. And I have a fantastic family of birth, birth family. I really do. We, we hang out. We go shopping. We have holidays. It's wonderful. But I now live in a place where my family is who I say they are. And it truly is the women in AA that carry me through and that I rejoice in being around. It's the women in AA that, that show up. It's the women in AA that support me. It's the women in AA that love me no matter what. That I don't have to pretend to be something I'm not. And they're like, all right, you're in a bad mood. Leave her alone. She's in a bad mood. Don't worry. She'll be in a better mood in about an hour. You know, they, they know when I get hungry, don't talk to me. Don't talk to me till you feed me when I get hungry. They know that and they accept that about me. You know, it's like, uh, it, that's just like a little thing. But, you know, the people in AA, when I've worked these steps with them, I've come to a level of intimacy and love that I never, ever understood, that I had never been exposed to, that I never thought was possible, that I now, this day, never want to live without. So I have to continue to work this program in order to get that. Um, and I had a lot of experiences not knowing what was good or bad. And that was, you know, my alcoholism was a perfect example. Currently, step seven is like my entire life. Um, currently, I, this past year, hit another one of those bottoms. Um, I guess it was about a year and a half ago now I hit another one of those bottoms where I knew my life was not where... I knew I was not where I needed to be. I knew inside of me that things were not right. I knew that in my relationship with God, I was not completely open. I knew that my current, I knew that my agnosticism at that point was specifically in my lifestyle and in my relationship. And, um, and I did not want to look at it. I did not want to take a look at it at all. And then it got worse and worse and worse because any time I recognize an agnosticism and decide that I'm not going to look at it, it gets worse. So when that happens, um, I finally gained the willingness to honestly take a look at it. And uh, fast forward, um, I ended up leaving my husband and leaving my house and leaving my entire life. And um, I ended up moving to a different town, but first I moved down to the shore back with my mom for a few months, and then, um, and then I went and I lived in an apartment by myself. And through that entire process, I had um, this sponsor who I will never forget. I would call her every day saying, this shouldn't be happening, this shouldn't be happening, it shouldn't happen this way, I should look at it this way. You know, everything out of my mouth was, this shouldn't be happening. I have done everything right in AA. This shouldn't be happening. I have worked the steps for years. I believe in God. I don't like him right now, but I still believe in him. This should not be happening. And um, at some point, uh, she kind of, I think, got a little sick of this, of this shouldn't be happening. And she tried to tell me, I think, in, in various ways or whatever. But all of a sudden, one night, I heard her. And I was sitting at her kitchen table, and we were doing my fourth step, and, and this past year, I've gone through the steps with a group of women, which has been an amazing experience again. So we're sitting there, and um, I was complaining to her because for me, when I, when I left my husband and when I left my life, I left my God in some ways, and I didn't even realize 
that it was. That, that level, I had a level of security in that, that all of a sudden my life, I was terrified to open my eyes in the morning. I was terrified to get out of bed. I was terrified to put my feet on the floor. I was terrified to pray. I was terrified. All of a sudden I had that feeling that alcohol used to take away, that I know a God can take away, but I couldn't get to God because I was so blocked. And I had that feeling of um, restlessness, irritability, and discontent that I talked about in the beginning. And I would call her, and I would I, I felt like I had just walked off the street again because people said share. So I was like, guess what? I'm calling, and I'm sharing, and you're going to regret telling me this. And, um, and I, I reached out, and people said, go to a meeting. So I went to a meeting, and people said, come here. And so I'd go there. And, and I literally just did what was in front of me again. Everything that was in front of me, I did. And when I started to feel afraid, and when I started to feel panic, and when I started to feel like nothing was ever good enough, and that this was never, just all the nevers, and going back into that victimhood, and, and feeling bad for myself, as if nobody else has ever gotten divorced. I'm sure I could take a poll here, and it'd be like 50%. But nobody else had ever gone through what I was going through. And... Um, I believe it was my fourth step. I think it was my fourth step. I'm not sure. But we're sitting there, and we're doing the steps, and I'm sobbing. Um, and uh, all of a sudden, my sponsor leans over the table at me, and she goes, Anne-Marie, your arrogance is going to kill you. And I was like, arrogance? What are you talking about? She was like, your arrogance will kill you. And I'm like... I don't know what you're talking about. I'm sitting here telling you that I'm a really bad person. I'm sitting here telling you that I feel really guilty. I'm sitting here telling you that I'm afraid that I made all of this up and left my husband on a lie. I'm afraid, I'm sitting here telling you that I am terrified I just threw my entire world out the window and destroyed this man the way that alcoholism has destroyed my life. And you're telling me I'm, I'm sorry, did you say arrogant? And she was like, yes, arrogance. And I was like, not computing, not computing, not computing. And then all of a sudden, I was like, oh, my guilt is just another form of arrogance. My saying this never should have happened is just another form of arrogance. My sitting here feeling bad for myself is just another form of arrogance. And my constant delusional lies that this shouldn't be happening is just another form of arrogance. It's happening. Accept it. It's right in front of you. If I truly believe that nothing, absolutely nothing happens in God's world by mistake, then nothing, absolutely nothing happens in God's world by mistake. I don't have to understand it. I don't have to like it. I just have to deal with it. And in order to do that, I have to let go of the outcome. Which brings us to the next principle of step seven. Remember, you are not in control. And all of a sudden, when this, when this whole thing clicked inside of me that, um, that my arrogance was going to kill me and that the way that I was, I was dealing with my divorce was basically running the show, was basically doing the whole self-seeking where it was like I was sitting here trying to direct everything, um, I was running my own play when I realized that um, I have to say that this experience with step seven made it very clear that even when I realized it, I had no power to stop it. So I was still in a place of powerlessness. I could see the truth, but self-knowledge wasn't going to fix it. Self-knowledge wasn't going to make it stop. What was going to make it stop was God. And what actually did end up happening was um, I remember also another thing my sponsor said, and I had seen it before in the big book, but all of a sudden now it made everything new, was uh, that part in how it works, may you find him now, and now is capitalized. Now is capitalized because that's where God is. God is not in the past. God is not in what was. God is not in what is going to be. God is here. And that was part of why I was so blocked. I had the resentments. I had the fear big time. And I had the harms done. 
And all of those things were blocking me from God, and that's what four, four and five are for, is to block, is to face and be rid of all the things that block me from God, is to start to open me up. But six, when I take a look at six, and I start to become willing to let go of these things that actually block me, it's seven where I can start to take the action and make the decision to let go of these things that block me. And that's why, that's why the change takes place in six and seven, is because it's where I gain the willingness and then it's where I make the decision and I take the action that follows it up. So what did that look like? Well, most recently, that looked like um, that looked like doing what I was told by my sponsor. I got up in the morning and I called her every morning as best as I could to do a daily meditation reading with her. Quite frankly, my ego is like, dude, you're 13 years sober, you got to call your sponsor every morning? Really? Dude, you're 13 years sober and you, you can't pray without your sponsor on the phone? And I couldn't. So I accepted it. And what's the, uh, what's the opposite of arrogance? It's humility. For me, that was growing in humility. And I got to tell you that that was the best 10 minutes of my day. Was getting up and talking to her first thing in the morning. Was getting up and reading the reading first thing in the morning. And... Um, when I actually went through my fourth step and picked out all the character defects, she told me to make a list of my character defects and then write down the opposite. And I was supposed to um, write down the character defects, write down the opposites, and ask God to remove the defects and then practice the opposite. But Emory's a little dense, as we all know now, so I didn't really understand that. And I was like, I don't, I don't know what you mean because I had no idea. <laughs> and I was being as arrogant as I was. So I wasn't really sure what self-centered looked like either at this point. I wasn't really sure all the things. I was like, I don't really know what they look like. So I was talking to a friend of mine one day, and I was like, I don't really know what this looks like. I'll call my sponsor, and she's like, well, you're acting out in arrogance again. And I'm like, I am? And she would say, yes, you are. And, and then she would explain to me how I'm acting out in arrogance. I was like, oh, okay, well, all right. And so she would say, pray for humility. And I was like, but, but what, hmm, what does humility look like? Not really sure what that looks like either. So I took the two columns and I turned them into four. And this worked really well for me. I wrote down what the defect was, and it also helped in terms of getting out on, um, for my fourth step, how this defect looked like. So I had defect, what that looks like, opposite, what that looks like. And it became very easy for me to follow, much, much easier. So I wrote down, like, arrogance. How does this look like? Well, when I think things shouldn't be as they are, when I'm feeling guilty, when I'm, uh, you know, when I would come up with other ways that arrogance would, um, would play out in my life. Okay, well, what's the opposite of arrogance? Humility. Well, what does that look like? That looks like if nothing happens in God's will by mistake, nothing happens in God's will by mistake. That looks like the serenity prayer. That looks like accepting what's in front of me. That looks like trying to stay in the present. And I would do that with, um, you know, isolating was one of my character defects. I love to isolate. I mean, I don't really love to isolate, but I do love to isolate. I'm sure there's another alcoholic here that understands that. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it would be like isolate. Well, how does, how, what does my isolation look like? It looks like just not calling people back. It looks like not answering my emails. It looks like not checking Facebook. It looks like, um, it looks like shutting down. I can isolate even when I'm participating in life. I can show up and just not tell you how I'm doing. I can, sh you know, isolating for me can also look like constantly asking you, how are you? So then I don't really have to tell you how I am, you know. So what's the opposite of that? Well, it's the opposite for me of isolating is participating in life. And what does that look like? That looks like being present with whoever I'm sitting in front of. It's not being on my cell phone when I'm out to dinner with people. It's, it's, um, actually paying attention when I'm on the phone with somebody. It's not texting while I'm trying to do something else. It's, it's being present wherever I am, and it's doing the best I can to call people back, to let people, and also to let people know what my limitations are. And that was discovered again this weekend, where it's like, you know, if I can't talk, I can just drop you a text or send you an email. It's like, hey, I'll call you on Tuesday when I'm free, but just not to completely ignore it. Um, but it's participating in my life. And I came to find out that I was extremely codependent and also extremely judgmental. 
and um, all these other things. And again, I just wrote out what that looked like, and then I would write down what the opposite was and what the opposite was to look like. And I couldn't do this necessarily on my own. I ran it by the women that I was going through the steps with. And, um, and so step six and seven all of a sudden became like a daily living practice. I could actually start to practice step six and seven. And it wasn't a practice of I'm going to work on myself. Uh-uh. Because I don't have the strength or the power to be any different than I am. But what I do have is I do have the strength and the power to ask God to make me different than I am. And where it comes down to for me is that that part where it talks about, where it says, um, I pray that you now remove from me every single defect of character which stands in the way of my usefulness to you and my fellows. That's the point of 6 and 7, is to have God remove from me whatever stands in the way of my usefulness to you and my fellows. It's not to render me white as snow. It's not to make me Mother Teresa. It's not even to make you like me, which, whew, if it were the case, I would love that because we all know that pride leads the parade in terms of what you think of me is very important. Uh-uh. The point of 6 and 7 is whatever stands in the way of my usefulness to you and my fellows. So again, I don't know what's good or bad. You know, I don't know necessarily that, um, you know, how holding a judgment about something isn't actually beneficial to somebody. You know, when I, in the early days when I was um, sponsoring after I went through the steps the first time, my old sponsor had this rule, no dating till your ninth step. So I passed that along, no dating till your ninth step, no dating until, you know, you've had your psychic change. Because trust me, you're going to pick the same that you picked when you were drinking, and then we're going to end up in a mess. And, you know, a lot of people would say that's a judgment. That's telling somebody what to do. That's, you know, whatever the case may be. And um, not for nothing, I actually saw that judgment save a lot of people, save a lot of people a lot of heartache. It wasn't for everybody, absolutely. But it wasn't taken away from me until it was no longer serving its usefulness to me and my fellows. Then it was taken. And I've had experiences like that where... I will have a character defect. I am willing to give it up, but it's not taken until it's outlived its usefulness. Um, and so when I look at this list of the new practice where it says, remember, you are not in control, hmm. there are things here that says back off, attempt to control, and you will fail, unburden yourself, you choose the journey, now deal with it, and your efforts at control will only lead to disharmony. And that's definitely been my experience with any time I don't want to change. Um, the last thing that I want to highlight is that um, my sponsor has this amazing way of taking it through the steps, like whatever problem of the day is going on. And I can take it through the steps. And the most useful tool that has come to me and from taking it through the steps has been step seven, step six and seven. When I, um, when I have something going on with me, you know, even, you know, take, exam take a, for example, when I'm feeling guilty about my marriage ending and feeling like it should have been different and uh, starting to go down that whole path of feeling bad for myself and wishing things were different and so on and so forth, I will stop. Once I can figure out what the defects of character are through four and five, which I can do in a conversation with a friend, which I can do by putting pen to paper, however the circumstances present themselves, I will sit and I will do that. When I get to six and seven, usually it's my arrogance, my greed, my self-pity, and my dishonesty. It's dishonest because the truth of the matter is the relationship had to break. The truth of the matter is, is that we were no longer serving each other. The truth of the matter is, is that in order for both of us to grow and to become all God intends us to be, we could no longer be together. I was not going to foster it for him and he was not going to foster it for me. So that's the truth of the matter. The truth of the matter is, is although nothing catastrophic happened and although nothing, you know, huge, like, you know, people are like, oh, someone cheated. Oh, it must be over money. Oh, you were about to lose that. No, not, none of that happened. None of that happened. It was just time. It's just time. We're not growing anymore. In fact, we're starting to hinder each other. That's the truth. So for me to sit here and to say, it shouldn't be this way, blah, 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 la, 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 I'm forgetting the truth. 
So I'm being dishonest. That's a character defect. My arrogance of feeling guilty. We all now know that guilt is apparently arrogant, which I learned this year, so I hope you learned it now tonight so you don't have to go through it. Um, but, you know, my guilt in terms of it should be a certain way, it should be this. No, mm -mm, it is what it is. Period, end of story. The self-pity, feeling bad for myself. Pity party is like my favorite party. I don't really enjoy it, but I do enjoy it. Again, it's like the isolating. I'm sure there's an alcoholic here who understands that. And my greed. I am indulging in these other three things when I know different. And I am expecting things to be different. I am expecting more of myself, and I am expecting more of the situation. I am expecting more of, more of God, really. So those are the four things that come out for me. My sponsor has taught me that I can use this prayer where I say, My Creator, I am now willing that you should have all of me, good and bad. I pray that you now remove from me every single defect of character, which stands in the way of my usefulness to you and my fellows. I pray that you especially remove from me my arrogance, my greed, my self-pity, and my dishonesty when it comes to my marriage. And I pray, God, that you grant me the strength to be, and then I'll list the opposite, whatever the opposite might be. You know, the dishonesty would be, I pray for the strength to stand tall in my truth, to stay in the truth, and to believe this truth. I pray for the strength to grow in humility, to realize that I don't know everything and that I don't know your path and that every time you've ever taken something from me, my life has become a hundred times better. The, uh, the greed and the self-pity would be, um, God, grant me the strength to see the amazing gifts you've put in my life and grant me the strength to start living in gratitude. I pray for these things, God, as I go out from here to do your bidding. Amen. And then I go about my day, and I do what's in front of me. And I guarantee you, God has always removed that from me. I have had experience after experience after experience after experience this year where doing something like that, applying the seven-step prayer like that, has literally saved my daily living. It has literally brought me to a place where I continue to grow in the humility. And where it says the seven-step principle here is, Humility, how we move further into action. In step six, we become willing well, We become willing to let go of old behaviors. Now we ask for help in actually letting them go. There's a sentence here that says, Can we learn to forgive ourselves? Well, by using this prayer, I can say that I'm growing to a place where I'm actually beginning to forgive myself. And that is a miracle. Karen can testify to. Um, I am actually beginning to forgive myself because I'm no longer taking the weight that this is all my fault. If nothing, if absolutely nothing happens in God's world by mistake, nothing happens in God's world by mistake, I will take responsibility absolutely 100% for my actions, for my part. That doesn't, that little phrase doesn't mean I'm perfect and rendered white as snow. Mm -mm. I take responsibility for my actions. That's why we go into eight and nine. And I let go of his. Step seven is about accepting life exactly as it is, right here, right now, in front of me, ready to go as a spiritual warrior. What's going to go in front of me today? And as simple as it is, you know, and it's as much as my ego would love to say, like, seriously, at 13 years sober, I have to call my sponsor every morning? Same thing. Seriously, at 13 years sober, I need to focus on what am I doing over the next hour? Yeah, that's exactly what you need to focus on. Because this program is simple. It's me that starts getting complicated. It's me that starts getting arrogant. And for me, when it says the step seven solution here in, in the workbook is uh, this problem is arrogance, the solution is simplicity. Before I can even get to simplicity, I have to get to openness. I have to be open. And sometimes when I am so clogged up, I will ask God to open me up and just to show me what's in front of me. And what's in front of me? I have to be at a 7.30 meeting. That's what's in front of me. So I go to my meeting, and I'm here, and I'm talking to all of you. And so what's in front of me next? Well, at 8.30, I'm sure I'll talk to some of you after the meeting, and then I'll go eat. And I don't know what's coming after that. I don't know if I'm supposed to go to the airport and pick up a friend of mine or if I'm going to go home and see my cat. I don't know. But it will present itself at the time it presents itself. And the coolest thing is, 
is that um, I am happier today than I have ever been before in my life. And it's only been a year since this whole thing started. A year and a half, maybe. I don't know. But I am truly happier than I've ever been before in my life. And I couldn't even see my own happiness. That's how arrogant I can be. It was my closest women friends who have said to me, Anne-Marie, I'm, I've always been glad to know you, but I'm proud to know you now. I don't know where this Anne-Marie came from, but she's never laughed so hard. She's never been so open, and she's never been so non-judgmental. And she's never been so beautiful. And I believe them. And I am growing to hopefully see it myself. But I don't yet. I see that I'm happier. I see that I am freer than I've ever been. And if you knew me five years ago, you knew I was happy. And I can't believe that I'm happier, you know. Um, and it just goes to show me that every time that I get to a place where I'm like, I don't, I don't know. And I think the world is ending. The world is ending so it can get bigger. And when the world gets bigger, that's when I know God is here. And I can say that for the most part, I know that God's in my life. I love God. And I'm doing things that I never could have done before. I'm actually living in my own apartment. I actually have my own apartment. I've never lived on my own before. You know, uh, this is a girl who was like in a psych hospital twice and, and, and rehab and this and that. I mean, my own mother was like, I don't know if you can live on your own. I'm not really sure that you can do it. And I was like, yeah, I know, me neither. I'm not really sure. But you know what? I didn't really think I could walk out of that, and I did. So, hey, let's go try it. Worst thing that happens is I move back in with you. And she was like, okay, go try. You know, but, uh, you know, but it's, it's actually been awesome. It's been fantastic. And she comes and stays with me. And, um, and uh, I continue to show up for life today because I don't really have any other options. But, again, I'm really happy to today. And when my mind gets really loud, like it did today, it's a seven-step prayer that tends to save me on a daily basis today. And um, for that, I'm truly grateful. And that's all I really have to say on step seven. We have five more minutes. Does anybody have any questions or comments? Or do people want to eat early? <laughs> so thanks for letting me share. <laughs> that, that was really funny. Well, does anybody have any questions or comments? And if not, I have a story for you. Okay, fine. Um, so, uh, like I said, I am literally doing what's in front of me. I had come to a place in my sobriety where I, uh, I didn't really do, I didn't go on retreats. I didn't do, like, weekend things. My... Um, my husband and I had made a decision years ago that, you know, weekends were ours and that was just the way it was going to be. So anything that was, you know, AA related that would take me away for the whole weekend, I just automatically said no to. Um, and so now I'm literally in a place where I don't know which way is up and I don't know how to feed myself or anything. So um, my sponsor says, we're going to go to Ohio for a retreat, a woman's retreat. And I was like, Okay, I'll go. I had no idea what I was getting myself into, where we are driving there, and we are going over my fifth step. <laughs> and it's myself, my sponsor, and another woman in the car that we're all going through the steps with. And this is when the arrogance was starting to peek through a little bit. Now, I am driving, and I am driving about 85 miles an hour. Yes. So I am driving, and, and the foot is getting heavier the more truth that's coming from the back seat from the sponsor, the more the, the more that like myself is being revealed to me. I am now going faster, and the tears are getting thicker. And she's like, "Oh my God, I think we're going to die." And um, we end up driving. I don't even know if we were in Ohio yet, or if we were still in Pennsylvania, but we uh, are driving. And as this is being revealed to me, all of a sudden, this car cuts me off. And it was the funniest thing because I was literally in the middle. Of it. I was like, "No." That license plate does not say ego. It did. The license plate in front of me that cut me off said ego. 
And then we would just all start laughing. So now I'm no longer sobbing. I'm cracking up. I'm like, seriously, God? Ego? You're really putting that right in front of me. And it's almost going to kill us because, you know, I almost like ran right into him. And so I slow down, and we're all laughing about it or whatever. And then I start, and I go back to be like, no, but that's not the truth. And as I'm trying to beat myself up or beat my husband up and going back and forth on the pendulum, because, you know, God is usually pretty even. I'm going back and forth on the pendulum. Usually a hint that's not God. Another car comes and uh, cuts us off, and it says the license plate reads fibs. Like, you're lying, fibs. Like, you're fibbing. You're telling a lie, fibbing. I was like, oh, my God, that says fibs. And then next thing you know, we actually arrived at the retreat, which was in Painesville. And I didn't know it was in Painesville. (laughs) And I told my sponsor, I was like, I don't think I should go on retreat with you anymore. (laughs) But it was was awesome. And uh, it was, you know, another experience of just trying and constantly being open because I literally sat there sobbing for half the weekend and the other half laughing. And the women around me just loved me for wherever I was at. And that's, that's a love I've never experienced before, and it's a love I don't ever want to live without. So um, we have one more minute left. Does anybody have any comments, questions? Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.